Mariana the Science Guy. Mariana the Science Guy. Mariana the Science Guy. Our chosen disease is the Spanish flu and we will be investigating some key questions regarding to how it affected the United States of America's population during World War I. We will be investigating the years 1918 and 1919. We have chosen this disease because we saw how an older time during World War I fostered an incredulous amount of diseases. Additionally, we can take advantage of the fact that records were kept regarding affected and dead. The Spanish flu has been one of the deadliest diseases of mankind's history, wiping out around a third of the world's population at the time. Therefore, having no cure and living under a condition of chaos, we question, how did the Spanish flu affect the United States of America's population during World War I? Right, so what is the Spanish flu and what does it do once it enters your organism? What we attribute as Spanish flu, also known as la gripe, is actually a virus. It's an extremely high contagious disease in the world. It affects the respiratory system, difficulting the user's breathing. Now, viruses are encapsuled RNA, most of the time, which modify and mutate to change their chemical composition in order to remain invisible under the detection of white cells. This is the reason why you get colds, the flu, and other viruses several times. Once the virus enters your body, a day or two, it will have found its way to the respiratory system and start reproducing in the respiratory tract, consisting of the trachea, bronchi, primary, secondary, and tertiary, bronchioles, including terminal and respiratory, and lungs, including alveoli. Scientists have concluded that after three to seven days succeeding flu exposure, our immune system already has detected malevolent reactions happening in our lungs, thus sending phagocytes and lymphocytes to battle whatever pathogen must be causing that harm. We're here at Maria Teresa Garcia, an 83 year old victim of the Spanish flu. How does it feel having the Spanish flu? I feel very tired. I have a lot of fatigue. I can't feel my limbs. That's correct, since after two to three days you have a feeling of fatigue due to the incredible amount of resources your energy, body, and immune system need to fight this disease. You may also have fever. <coughs> oh, Maria Teresa! No! Well, it is true the Spanish flu can kill you, so be careful, everyone! Justin Reamer, current beholder of the Spanish flu, can you please inform our watchers what a burden it is to be victim of this virus? Yes, I have strong headaches, chills, and sneezes. It has been proved how the flu virus disrupts your respiratory system, leading to sneezing or even a feeling of coldness, which can also be attributed to the chills. Fever is also very common when feeling cold, since the body's temperature is raised, thus causing discomfort. This happens while the influenza virus is reproducing, damaging cells and invading new ones at a rapid pace. Right, so now that we know what the Spanish flu is and what its effects are, let's explore how this virus can spread. This type of influenza can spread via droplets, meaning how if an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks, some of the virus's particles will come out, ready to be inhaled by another person. Additionally, it can be transmitted via indirect contact, meaning how if a sufferer, after touching the mouth, eyes, or an infected area, touches an object to then be touched by a healthy person who rubs his hand over his mouth, eyes, or nose, this person also becomes infected. What happened in 1918 was tragic. Having little to no immunization due to the influenza's mutation meant it would strike millions and millions of people being caught by surprise. Furthermore, since we're focusing on US military being all crowded together in a small trench, you could expect this disease to be infected at an incredible fast pace. Let's say all these flower grains were to be in large Spanish flu particles. If someone gets catch it and they sneeze, this happens. Achoo! <laughs> now I have it without knowing. <laughs> this is an example of airborne transmission. And direct transmission, already explained, will look similarly to this. <laughs> if 
Daniela has the Spanish flu and she's touching something. She, this object gets the Spanish flu particles as observed here. Now, <laughs> when I get it, and I begin to touch it, I also have the Spanish flu. So then I touch my eyes, mouth or nose and I have the Spanish flu as well. So everyone needs to be very careful when getting someone with Spanish flu. But why was the USA affected? The reason why the Spanish flu infected the USA is uncertain, but we do have an idea how it began to spread. In 1918, in Haskell County, the first cases occurred during the month of January. After reporting them, the infected soldiers likely carried influenza to other army camps in the States. 24 of the 36 large camps had the outbreaks before carrying the disease overseas. Meanwhile, the disease spread in the U.S. civilian communities. During World War I, the Spanish flu was common among the military. It was easily transmitted between the soldiers due to shared spaces, sanitary facilities, and clothing garments. <laughs> military camps fostered influenza due to their crowded conditions. and the Western from Europe use trenches under crowded conditions. Trenches are built underground and have many paths that lead to exits. They give troops protection from the enemy's firearms and substantially shelter them from artillery. The virus would constantly travel with the military personnel from camp to camp across the Atlantic. By September 1918, influenza and pneumonia had sickened 20% up to 40% of the USA. Astrologers believe the Spanish flu had a connection with comets and stars. They believed each passing comet predicted our doom. The closer they came to Earth, the closer death was upon to the human race. Just like ancient tribes used to predict, their only evidence to support this was the term influenza. It's believed to be derived from the Italian phrase influenza coeli, meaning influence of the heavens and stars. Did a cook from a U.S. military training base cause the great flu pandemic of 1918? The Camp Fuston in Kansas was a military training facility that had 26,000 young men packed in barracks. On Monday, March 11, 1918, the cook, Private Albert Gitchell, awoke feeling achy and hot, his throat burning terribly. He had to drag himself down to the infirmary where the medic on duty told him he was in no position to get out of serving food. You have to cook! We need to feed the people! You don't understand! I feel very tired and I feel like I might die. Oh, come on. Get back to work now. With a fever over 39 degrees Celsius, Gitchell had chills as well as aches and pains just about everywhere. He was put under surveillance, but nothing could change the fact that he had been serving all of the camp's meals. <laughs> Later, Corporal Lee Drake came in with almost the identical symptoms. Then, Sergeant Adolf Herbie had them too. One by one, the disease spread, with fevers at 40 Celsius, blue faces, and horrendous coughs. They all made their way to the infirmary. By midday, Camp Foston had 107 cases of flu, a total of 522 reported within the first week alone. A staggering 1,127 by the end of April rolled around. By the end, 46 of those afflicted had died. This data leads to the assumption that the Spanish flu having originated from America. Nevertheless, there are previous cases of the recordings of January before March. These records came from Europe. The 22nd of May 1918, the epidemic was a headline in Madrid's newspapers, along with many other cities. On most countries, they would warn people about the Spanish influenza by placing warning posters about the deadly disease, including advice not to take any person's breath, try to keep your mouth and teeth clean, avoid those who coughed or sneezed, not to visit poorly ventilated places, and not to use common drinking cups or other utensils such as common towels, etc. Although we now have advanced mechanisms for trying to cure this disease, such as yearly vaccines, in 1918 they didn't, and their only method to cure this would be 
be to induce sufferers small measures of drugs which would make patients feel better or compress ice packs on feverish patients. Back then, an assured way of preventing infection would be to keep the body strong and able to fight germs, including an ample space of exercise, play, rest, wearing warm clothes, spending time in fresh air, avoiding crowds, and eating sufficient, wholesome, and properly selected foods. These advices are still given today to prevent basically any diseases. The Spanish flu also occurred in an age of wartime context, making it a bit harder for doctors to find out what was the cause of this infectious disease. Studies estimate that a deadly virus during 1918 and 1919 ended the lives of around 100 million people around the world. The Spanish influenza has affected a worldwide populace between 200 to 700 million. During the Great War's years, Spanish flu deaths have been estimated to be worldwide around 50 to 100 million. Many people have died since actual vaccines weren't given out until the mid-1940s. Not only that, but World War I also left the United States with an extreme deficiency of physicians and other health workers. Some hospitals were overloaded with flu patients, and in other communities, it was ordered to keep all entering under surveillance and other on quarantine. Libraries also halted lending books, and regulations forbid spitting. People were also advised to shaking hands and others to try to stay indoors as much as possible. The Spanish influenza also left a big hole in humanity since it wiped out families leaving huge amounts of widows and orphans. The Spanish flu also had a bad hit in the U.S. economy since the businesses were forced to shut down due to employees' sickness. Other services such as mail delivery and garbage collecting workers were deterred due to flu strike. Let's make an account of all the statistics gathered throughout this documentary. 675,000 American soldiers died of the Spanish flu. 116,516 died during the war. This means that more than five times as many American soldiers died of the Spanish flu than by actual military confrontation. Important notice, SFC does not mean San Francisco City, but Spanish flu casualties. And WC does not mean toilets, but war casualties. 40% of the US Navy were affected, and 36% of the US soldiers were affected, which leaves 24% as others. Faint records keep up to 1,200,000 affected. This is because they had to do schools, private homes, theaters, etc. as makeshift hospitals with untrained civils curing patients. Therefore, it was quite hard to keep track of the astounding amount of affected who would later die or miraculously survive. The fourth year at the trenches on the Great Offensive to Germany, the flu struck, sickening 26% of the army, more than 1 million men, and killed more than 30,000 before they even got to France. Sickness rate became one of approximately 40%. It's known how in a specific United American camp, the 27th of August, 1918, three cases of influenza were reported. Two days later, the 29th of August, 58 were reported. A great increase. The most scientifically supported way to stop the Spanish flu, or at least make the symptoms a lot milder, would be to simply stay away from the people that have the virus. <coughs> we are speaking now in brainstorming terms how this team of scientists has investigated different possibilities to stop this virus. And we will now display a brief of our findings. Like that, you will most probably assure your health. An alternative for relinquishing the flu would be to place these people who do have the virus in quarantine so that spreading deters completely, while being treated in the center. As warning posters alerted, you may have the germs on you. Therefore, no one should touch their eyes, nor mouth, or nose. Are the most evident open places of your body and it is where pathogens are most likely to enter. If you have to be in close quarters with someone who has the Spanish flu, then you should always clean the surfaces of anything you share and have to touch so the indirect contact spread is minimized. And of course, use Nina a protection mask, either him or you. Since you may inevitably get pathogens on your skin, you should make sure to, on a regular basis, wash your hands or shower. Another precaution to stop the Spanish flu from spreading to other countries or even continents is to minimize traveling so that the disease will not travel as much. A failed example of this would be the modernly existing case of dengue, contracted by two Spaniards. This mosquito has been traced back to an early pipeline. The world has changed massively since the Spanish flu. A great awareness of vaccines has increased ever since to find a way to cure it. Many alternatives have been sought, all without permanent solution. For example, doctors recommend the intake of yearly flu vaccines in order to minimize any possible effect of that year's flu season, usually in autumn through winter. 
In conclusion, the Spanish flu has been a pushing factor for the seeking of many different vaccines and research to deter lethal viruses, which nowadays have some sort of remedy. Furthermore, as a consequence of this flu's outbreak, we have learned quite much about it, its different chemical composition, how it links to other viruses, etc. Altogether, all the knowledge grouped by all viruses is of extreme value to the scientific sector, the same way as it is for the humanitarian one, by preventing and foretelling future outbreaks to be able to stop them at the first sign, thus having saved millions of lives. In conclusion, we have realized how all scientific areas, factors, discoveries, and much more come in hand in hand when developing society, which at the same time helps science evolve, and so forth. It is humanity which helps science develop, and it is science what, ha what aids humanity in its survival and growth. Without one or the other, the corresponding factor would cease to exist, hence emphasizing the need and importance we should all give to this interdisciplinary unit. The investigation that we have undergone, making us discover this aspect which we should all keep in conscious mind the rest of our lives.